Thank you very much. I have 30 minutes starting from now. I wish I could make this presentation in German. Spark and Dutch, but I speak very little. So if you speak German, I understand. Um, as the days goes, this is what we have here. Um, good. Um, in the menu, this is what I try to cover in 30 minutes. So bear with me if I rush very fast. If I'm too fast, you can slow me down. But the other thing I would like to emphasize, this presentation is made in the most widely spoken language in the world. And that is? Mandarin. Mandarin or bad English. So this presentation is actually in bad English. So if you don't understand my pronunciation, you can stop me or engage me later on. Um, to begin with, many people ask, where do you come from? Because I've been hopping around the universe all the time. <laughs> I come from a very little, small country there called the Gambia. You will not Google it. If you Google, you will find Zambia. I'm from the Gambia. So that's a small country there where I come from. That's where I call home, but I have many homes in the past years. I've been hopping around the world, going throughout the universe, doing all sorts of things. And my final home now, where I am, is in Japan. That is home number 25. These are the places where I lived more than six months walk there. That's where I was. Don't ask me what I was doing in Japan on the day of the earthquake and tsunami. I was lecturing open source software to high school students. That is what happened during that day. Um, my research interest is rather fluid. It has already been introduced, so I will just jump through it. My basic background is software engineering, open source software development. I develop, but now I leave it to the young, active people. I'm too old. So I just keep on asking on the empirical part of it to try to find methodologies how you can improve, um, deploy, diffuse open source software. But for me, coming from Africa, this is not enough. I wanted a practical aspect of my research, and I added an applied part, which I am doing now with the United Nations as a postdoc. All the open source software for sustainable development, innovations, and everything. But this is not separate. All these parts keep on running around my head all the time as I go, so that it will have a big meaning. I will not try to lecture because I have seen a lot of open source software experts here. But I will just try to emphasize the business implications of the things I'm about to discuss. Open source software development is understood by everyone. But nowadays, we have multiple actors. There, governments, companies, many, nearly everybody is involved in open source software. But the freedom we have compared to proprietary software is the ability and the opportunity to exit the development cycle whenever we want. And this provides a lot of other opportunities. So I'll just skip this very quickly. The other part, which is of business value when you are involved in open source software, is community dynamic aspects. In our traditional everyday work in offices, we find a community structure in every office, but the community structure and the governing mechanisms are completely different when we move into the open source software development environment. In the past few years, these are oops, and then in the past few years, these are the models that have been emerging. I'm trying to work on this, and this is going to be discussed by many of the presenters here. Everybody knows, but for me, what is important is this passive user group that presents something like a business vision. They are not active in it, they are just passive users. But for many companies, this is where the opportunities will come from. If you hook up with this larger group, then you have a higher business potential. And these are the people who will go outside and then talk to other people, other people talk to other people, other people talk to other people, then you have a multiplying effect. Um, inside this group, as a lot of us have noticed, we have got the active developers. It's, uh, people who will pull our box. So if you are an IT-based software development companies, that is your target group. You want a lot of testers in your software. Then we have the significant contributors, some of the gurus who contribute patches and whatever. Well, the most important group, or almost most important, is the core developers. These are the people who decide what goes in, what goes out of the project. Then, up as the years goes by, we started looking at this community dynamics. What are the business implications? What is the educational implication if a community is structured in this manner? And then, as we already know, if you are employed, if you are at one point, you remain there until you are dead. 
or you go and do a master's program, then you get promoted or you do advanced diploma. So this is what has happened in everyday business companies. But then we try to introduce, as we look at open source software companies, some business flexibility in the way the companies operate. What is this business flexibility? We believe, and I think it operates in many of the open source software projects. The more you contribute, the better position you get. This is the belief. I don't know how true this thing is, but in open source software, that is what is pro promised in most of the business circles. Moving from one transition to another, moving from one transition to another, and giving the opportunity of an individual to take part in most of the software development activities. To some extent also in marketing, in management, in whatever associated with your business activity. Now, then we looked at these community structures we said. If you have all these concentric circles, which are now present in open source business, what is happening? When we started observing it, we looked at how companies behave inside these communities. What you can see is, for the developers, the trend is simple. Most of the people who are involved in open source software, if they start out from the periphery, their intention is to get to the core. While well, the motivation why people get involved in open source software have been changing over the years. But the core item remains moving to the core, where you can influence the development cycle. Then we looked at companies, we've already been talking about Oracle here and all this. Company. We looked at, for the company what is more interesting is to get an exposure, is to reach a wider market, is to reach a wider group. So there seems to be some conflicts between what the developer intended from the beginning, how we get involved in the company, and what the companies want. The companies actually, they want to get hold of the core developer, who is very much talented in it. But their idea is to reach a wider group. So they are moving from the core to the periphery, why the developers are moving from the periphery to the core. And this explains some of the conflicts that we are seeing in the forking process of open office. I think so. So this is one of the methods we've been using to explain. So what has been the situation over the years, and I think is still the case for many people, open source software is Linux versus Microsoft. And this thing has been the David versus Goliath war all the time. Even when you go on advocating for open source software, this is what is happening. Well, as you can see, a lot of things about Godzilla. But when I refer to Godzilla as it, you find out that it is also information technology. This Godzilla trend now has passed. For many people, it has passed. For in Europe, in the United States, I think it's almost gone. Now, what people are asking is, where in my operation do I need open source software? For businesses, this is what they are asking. They don't mind whether I'm already using open uh, closed source software now. They know uh, they are using closed source software, but their idea is where do I need open source software to supplement what I already have? How best can I leverage open source software projects and communities? This has been the fundamental question. So what is happening in the trend? We've been moving from the David and Goliath war scenario into an ecology of systems. And in this ecology, in recent research, we try to coin a term calling it AIM. That is coexistence of proprietary software and open source software. I don't know how true this is, but I think this is going to be the future trend. So what do we want? Just to apply best practices in software development or technology business, whether it is open source or closed source, just the best practices is what we are interested in. But if you have open source or you have closed source, if these two technologies are not able to match, integrate, and create business value, it's of no use. So what IT businesses are asking, how best can I integrate open source software with my existing infrastructure? Whether it is Unix or proprietary software, you want things that integrate and create value for your business. Maximizing business value and learning opportunities. The technology should be able to help the organization to learn from the past mistakes, from economic turmoils and whatever is it. So this is the new trend we have observed. Well, that is the trend from the business economy. Thing. But certain things remain fixed as we look at surveys that are coming. In many parts, as we are saying, in the open source software development market, it has been Windows platform that has dominated. Because people like me are schooled in Windows environment. So people continue on developing this. But you can see, as time goes on, 
in 2019 are beginning to shift. So people are beginning at least to start developing platform in the Linux environment. But I think this is the future trend. All development will be basically go into the Linux environment. For me, what is more interesting is in the deployment section. Even in 2007 uh, up to 2010 at the beginning, even though people were developing a lot of applications on the Windows platform, they were aiming to deploy it in the Linux environment. And what is happening now, a lot of people who are developing in the Linux environment are also deploying it in um, the Windows environment. And this, this is evident when you look at the platform requirement for all the open source software projects in SourceForge. When you tabulate it, you will almost find a 50-50% split between platforms in Windows environment, platform in Linux and Mac combined together. So this seems to be a future trend. Then I looked at other projects and things that I'm very much interested in. And this is, well, Linux Foundation, so they don't believe it. It's Linux, so they promote Linux. But the trend is very simple. And for me, even though organizations believe that their use of Linux will increase in the next 10, 20, 30 years, that is evident. Everybody knows about it. For me, what was very much important was this mission critical. Because from 2001, 2002, going up to 2005, this has been the main problem before NASA and other people came. That you cannot use open source software in mission critical environment, particularly databases, because they are the key to your business organization. So you don't want to use open source software. But the trend has shifted, and currently a lot of use of open source software in business. Then I looked at an other trend, still now from the Linux survey, and this is very interesting. A lot of people are now ask, saying that technical superiority is their main drivers for using open source software. This is 2010. This was not the case a few years back. A few years back, what people were mostly complaining about was about vendor locking. Vendor locking, I don't want to be locked, I don't want to be locked. But they stopped talking about locking. That shows that the technologies are converging. So new trends are emerging. And some of these trends, security is really very surprising. That I told security should come high on the agenda. Now we have got this cloud computing saga problem. But what people are interested in for business is mostly is technical, technical superiority of open source versus closed source software. Then we looked at other benefits and barriers. Well, the benefits are simple. Any kind of survey you run, it will just keep on increasing. But license its costs, I'm very happy this thing still remain on top. But for many organizations, this is a major problem. And the position, as they looked at it, telecommunications are one of the major users of open source software. Some of the big organizations are all in telecoms. Then we move to all these barriers. What I'm interested in here is standardizing on non-specific open source software technologies and platform. This trend seems to pass over the years. Then we looked at, you asked them, how, what is your position on these new technologies? The biggest surprise for me is we wait until new technology is proven before we adopt it. This is where we started looking at the policy implication. So if you are a company and then you are just starting now and then so, somebody is using a Linux server and then you came in, you said, I cannot use it. I want to wait until everybody tells me that it's perfect. I'm using it. If, if this survey is true, then it means that a lot of IT businesses are still in limbo. And actually, this is what is happening all the time. And then we went on, we asked the other group, which is this one, 4.6, uh, asking them about new technology trends. The idea is that we are pioneering and adopting new technology. If you are pioneers in adopting new technologies, but the majority of them are still waiting, it means that there is a lot of conflict. The final justification is that the open source software business environment is still uncertain about open source software technologies. So whenever you run surveys, you have some conflicting results. And then we looked at the sustainability if businesses are using open source software. Is this sustainable? Will they continue? One of the things I am interested in is this one. Use open source software and contribute back to at least one open source software project company to help improve the quality of the project. And we are asking, are these companies who are using open source software basically contributing 
Well, this, this is not Oracle or HP or something. These are small companies. That's what we are interested in, whether they are plowing back some of the resources they are getting. But what is happening in this trend is that there seems to be a trend earlier which picked up a lot of contribution. But as time goes on, a lot of companies are still uncertain whether they have to contribute, contribute back to open source software. We would like to see this kind of survey repeated because this is between 2009 2010. So you might complain their contribution to open source software dropped because of the market factors, the economic crisis and everything. We don't know whether this is going to pick up now. Uh, the other thing we wanted us use open source software, but those not interact with open source software project communities. That's a very serious factor that we looked at. If you are using open source software as a business and you are not interacting with the community, one day you will be dead because you really need that community if your business is going to be viable. But again, the trend has not been cost consistent. In 2007, we had over 40%. Then in 2009, it dropped. Then in 2010, it picks up again. So it seems to be also fluctuating. Um, we looked at um, other factors of open source software, external factors like recession in the United States, particularly this. The only companies that escape, ICT-based companies that escape the recession, we are open source software companies. Well, you can say this is Linux Foundation survey, but it seems that there is a lot of safety net and risk sharing in open source software business. As it goes on, you interview people what best characterizes your perception of the Linux platform. If the big companies, this is IT professionals, these are companies with 500 million US dollars a year revenue, these are big. If these people believe why their perception of Linux is improving. It means that, as you say, open source business confidence is improving. So if you are coming into the business now, well, you will find out the big men already said it's good, so it might be good for your business as well. That brings me to policy problem. What happened in this kind of survey here, in all these big companies that are surveyed, if you ask them, do you have open source software policy? And we are still running a big open source software policy survey in the United States, in Asia, in Europe, and some parts of Latin America. The idea is, I don't have. And this is why I came into this presentation. So most of these companies don't have policy. Now I try to formulate my own definition. What is an open source software policy? It's not different from any other policy. But it is a series of interrelated guidelines and interventions in your business. You have guidelines, and that tells you how to use open source and how not to use open source. But that is not enough. You need to develop, develop interventions. If the business goes wrong, do you have something written that tells you how to react to it? So what happens then? Open source software policies also have got a wicked problem. Like any other wicked problem situation is, it has no solution. The solution to a wicked problem, the theory of wicked problem says, the solution to a problem is actually a problem. So if you have open source software policy, you have not solved your problem, but it is good to have one. And some of these I said here, yeah, for policymakers need to change the mindset of managers. This is why open source is a problem. If you are formulating other IT policies in telecommunication industry, the people are already used to the technologies. You don't have a lot of problem. But for open source software, it is new. If you are a policy designer, you have a problem because you need to change the mindset of many people. There is no definite formulation. There is no book. There is no university lecturer. There is no professor who will teach you how to write open source software policy. It doesn't exist. But you still need to develop one. Policy will not solve your problem. When I started lecturing policy in Japan and other people, oh yes, so I need an open source. It will not solve your problem. In fact, it might create more problems for you but you still need to have one. There is no good or bad policy. I have not seen any good or bad policy. The only bad policy I have seen is Oracle's policy. <laughs> it is bad, and we saw the consequences. So what happens if you are a policy designer in open source software? Formerly, you had very few stakeholders or actors to consider. But with the increase in the ecology of participants in open source software, then everything is bigger. So your policy decision problems become very big. 
If you are one, then I pity you because all these things keep on going in your head and eventually you are dead. The only solution I can tell open source policy people are this. If you are inside an industry, if you don't know that company very well, what I mean, you, do, you need to know from the CEO right down to the driver to design a policy. Because if any element is missing, you might run into a problem in your policy. So you know the company well, but know the developers and users. I'm not sure how this thing has worked with Oracle. Again, I'm very sorry to use Oracle. Because I thought Oracle has learned from Sun's microsystems, and we just discuss it now, how Sun Microsystem moved from other projects, acquired them, then Oracle acquired Microsun, and then it goes and goes. But they have not learned at all. The main problem was the conflict between developers and users. No the vendors, it makes it more difficult because there are more vendors and suppliers. But most importantly, to be flexible. If you are designing an open source policy and you are flexible, then you will be successful. Then, what kind of policy approaches happen? This is not applicable to Europe or United States because we have not got data. But we can say that it's applicable to Africa and it's applicable to Southeast Asia. We looked at a lot of companies that are using open source software and we started. We found out that there are governments or municipalities which applies to Austria that have enacted policies, open source software policies, mandating organizations and institutions to use policies. If this thing exists in your business environment, then you have a leeway because then even the customers know about it, so you can use this policy. But what is emerging in most of the countries we have surveyed is this what you call a natural ecosystem. Many companies that operate in many countries, they do not have open source software policy. And the government doesn't care about open source software policy. But businesses are prospering anyway. They are prospering as much as zero policy. So it means there is also a natural ecosystem for businesses to prosper, even if governments do not enact policies. I think this is important. Then we looked at all these small companies. Many of them don't have um, open source software policy. But for me, I think if you are small, it's good. But when you grow big, then you'll have a big problem if you don't have a policy. Why do you need a policy in the first place? Well, these are some of the things I will, I guess, could happen. The only reason why you may need a policy is to ensure that the company is in agreement about how to use open source. You have various departments, various units, various faculties. You really need to harmonize and agree on how to use open source or where to use open source software. Maximize the benefit. Well, we will look later on about these components. Now, over 82, 83% of all open source of all software contains open source software component. So you really need to develop some policy on component. Maximize the legal, technical, and business risk. Oh. If you are using open source and you are using closed source, and you are using open source from project X and other companies using open source from project Y. If you have a policy that tells you how to use open source software and you harmonize that policy with the other company, then the chance, the risk factor, be reduced because you are sharing it not only with yourself but with your companies and your developers and users. Uh, re reasonable comparison with commercial software, people don't agree with this. I said you really need to have any open source policy must reflect some part of proprietary software because for any business that is 100% open source software, I have not seen it yet. Maybe if you have one, you can tell me. You must have some elements of proprietary software in your company. Tap in the skills. This is very important if you are a businessman. If everybody is going into open source software, develop developing countries. Now over 80, 60 percent of all developing countries are moving into open source software. So if you are running a business, designing a policy, put some policy that will give you access to brick and developing countries. Um, a lot of the things I've been looking at in companies that deal with open source software is similar questions. It is always business as usual. Any company you ask, do you use open source in your business? They'll tell you yes. But the yes is always, most of the people, if you ask top IT people, they don't know. Where they use open source software is just in their servers. 
email servers there, data servers or whatever. They'll tell you, oh, yes, we have. We are using Linux. We are in the server. That's all where it stops. Then you ask them, do you have an open source policy? A lot of them will tell you yes. And when they bring it out, it's just two pages, or three pages of paper, or somebody wrote something about a project. But actually, most of them say, no, but I would like to have one, or we are working on it. And you ask them, when will it be finished? They'll say, ah, next week, or we are working. What is preventing you from having open source software policy? A lot of them will write, the usual company bureaucracy. We have to hire somebody, we need a professor, we need something. But if you are in business, don't wait for this. You need to adopt a policy now. A good source, one of the best papers on policy I've seen is Tommy Peters. This is circulating on the internet, how to write an open source software policy. It's not fully complete, but it will give you a basic idea if you are a business person in open source software. Ten elements. If I am looking at any open source software policy, these are the things I look for. Is it concise, consistent, clear, and simple? If it contains a lot of jargons, hacker jargons, the simple man at the street will not understand it, and other policymakers will not understand it. And for some of the policy documents we looked at now, especially OZO, anybody working for OZO? The Open Source Observatory for Europe. Yes. Uh, when, when we drafted this policy reviews for the European Commission, we had so many big terminologies there, then the people in Brussels don't understand them. But you need to put something very clear. A good business model that captures global software development. Avenues for support, and the worst thing people don't want to hear. Inside your policy, you need to detail how you can capture all the projects. After all, it is a jungle out there. If a project is good for your business, you need to adopt a policy to hire it and take it away from there. Mixed proprietary software, open standard, existing strategy, very important. If your policy is one directional, it is going to fail. It needs to have a lot of branches where you can exit if things go wrong. And forecast future trends, which is not easy. But if you get a lot of data and you interact a lot of, with open source of their projects, you will know what is going to happen. The only thing we didn't know, we didn't know that open office was going to be forked into Libra. Is it? For five years ago, we didn't know. There was no sign that it was going to happen. But anyway, there was a sign that we are not going to have kernel 2.6.8 or 2.8, we knew. And two, three days ago, Linux announced now 3.0, and everybody's confused. So there are certain things in open source that are predictable. The other part are not predictable. A good policy should be able to build some forecast in future what is going to happen in the open source. Transferability, a very, if you have a policy that only says how you can use open source databases is not good enough. Because later on in your business, you might not decide to purchase Microsoft Office. You might need to use Open Office. But do you then need to rewrite a completely new policy? No. You need to have a very flexible policy, adaptability that you can spread in all other businesses. Malleability from physics. If something is malleable, it means you can bend it or you can hammer it, you leave it, it comes back to its natural shape. And this is my next discussion. Policy framework, we develop a lot of framework depending on this malleability. What happened? We hypothesize that as stress increases, many policies will eventually deviate from their intended target. And for all the companies that have policies, this is what happened. And again, I'm very sorry to use again uh, Open Office and Libra Office. This, there was some stress inside Oracle, whatever happened inside the company itself, that decided that we need somebody to be hired who will be responsible for our new baby open office. That's internal, I'm sure, maybe before it got to the open office community. So there was a sum of strain that runs that will crack whatever policy they had. Then policies inability to reconcile company and community demands will eventually need to net it. That's a physics terminology, it means complete break. When the news got out, when they started discussing it, then it was eventually that it was going to happen. And this is what we predicted some years ago before this walking happened. 
So at some point, point A, you have a really resilience. Just gather the data and information to formulate your policy. Then you go up to a certain point, it's just optimization. This is very important. This is where you keep on sponsoring all the kinds of events so that they fall in love with you. If you start having problem when hypothesis one and two, zero and one are not met, then you are at this breaking point. And this is what happened in Libra office. We are predicting again that even though there is forking in projects, the two projects might reconcile again into the same unit. There is no evidence for this. Example, is it possible that Oracle will rebrand Open Office again? Maybe. They, they might be able to change the name, they might be able to change the community, they might be able to convince the whole open source software world that Open Office is still open source and is working perfectly well. And everybody will come back and Libra will be dead. This is our projection here. I don't know how this is going to happen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.